today uh, for the next in our series of webinars on topics um, related to the COVID-19 pandemic and how hospitalists are responding and setting up strategies uh, to address this in their communities. Uh, today, we're joined by a team of hospitalists from the University of Colorado uh, who are going to share uh, how they built an inpatient clinical pathways for standardized COVID-19 management. Um, all of SHM's resources around COVID-19 are uh, recorded and are placed on our COVID uh, webpage, uh, which is www.hospitalmedicine.org slash coronavirus. As the pandemic continues, SHM is going to continue to be building resources and drawing together hospitalists from all over the country to learn from their experiences and perspectives and, uh, and to really help the field uh, grow and move forward together. So today we're joined by Dr. Anunta Virapongsi, Dr. Sarah Scarpeto, and Dr. Jonathan Pell from the University of Colorado here to share their expertise. Um, and I also just wanna, uh, as a quick note uh, for a couple logistic things, First, um, apologies uh, on the slide deck. Uh, uh, some of the slides say uh, Team Health on them. This is an SHM uh, webinar uh, that is uh, in partnership with our colleagues from the University of Colorado. Um, and we'll make sure that that is uh, amply noted on the recording. Also, uh, if you have questions, we do encourage you to type those into the question box, uh, which can be found on the uh, on in the dialog box on the right hand side of your uh, screen, uh, we will have a question and answer section that's moderated by staff at the end of the presentation. And so, if you type in your question throughout the presentation, we'll get to as many questions as we can. Uh, so, with that, I will turn it over uh, to Anunta, Sarah, and John. Thank you, all three of you, very much for. Uh, your time this afternoon and for sharing uh, the work that you and your team at the University of Colorado have done uh, to develop clinical pathways. So thank you and uh, we all look forward to the presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Um, hi everyone, my name is Ananta Virapongsi and I'm a hospitalist and the Director for Quality and Patient Safety for the Division of Hospital Medicine at the University of Colorado. I'm joined today by my two colleagues, Sarah and John, who will introduce themselves in more detail later in this presentation. I know that time is really precious for you guys during this pandemic, so thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us for this webinar. Um, we're here to share with you some of our experiences in building a COVID-19 inpatient pathway and to give you some ideas on how to avoid the pitfalls that we've encountered as we've gone through this process. Um, we also hope that by the time you finish this webinar, you'll be able to understand the role that hospitalists play in the development of inpatient pathways and some things that you might wanna think about as you embark on rapid change management and implementation, as well as how you're going to evaluate them when you do implement them. To structure this webinar, we've decided to frame it as a PDSA cycle of improvement or a plan, do, study, act, just to make things more organized. So why clinical pathways? Why did we decide to go this route rather than building an order set or putting together a diagnosis and treatment policy document? Well, pathways offer a lot of advantages. Firstly, they have decision support in the form of an algorithm. So you can include nuances that you can't normally include in an order set, such as details about transition of care, some educational points, and exceptions to the rules of treating that particular disease entity. Ideally, pathways should also um, improve your efficiency if they're integrated into a provider's workflow well. And there's some evidence that pathways can decrease adverse events and decrease cost and can also improve the length of stay. There are some intangible benefits as well to pathways. If you're an academic institution, you can uh, use the pathway as an adjunct to a research project. And if you're building a pathway that involves other specialties like emergency medicine, it can be used as a way to share ideas and create mutual understanding over each other's workflow, kind of like a olive branch, if you will, between different departments and divisions. But there are problems with pathways. Um, we all like to feel autonomous when we're practicing medicine. So using a clinical pathway might seem a little bit too much like cookbook medicine, um, especially if it's not updated regularly. 
Or if the workflow to use it is too clunky, then your providers might not use it or try to figure out workarounds so they can avoid using it so they can get on with what they're doing since they're very busy. Um, so for these reasons, adoption is a really huge and common issue with pathways. There's also the problem of anchoring bias. Once you get into the pathway, you might not consider other differentials. Like for instance, if you have a patient that comes in with viral symptoms that look like COVID and you go into a COVID pathway, you might not consider that the patient may also have PCP pneumonia, for instance, if they're immunocompromised. Finally, in the literature, the effect of pathways on certain outcomes like mortality is mixed due to the heterogeneous nature of what pathways look like at various institutions. So you don't always know if the pathways you're developing are truly affecting care in the long run. But in the time of COVID, the game has changed. We have volunteers who are coming in to the inpatient setting, even though they've never practiced medicine in the inpatient setting for a very long time. And we have medical students that are being graduated early so they can join the front lines. All of these providers need a quick and easy way to learn about how to treat COVID patients and how to work in your hospital without the long orientation and ramp up period that most of us typically had prior to practicing medicine. And really, hospitalists are well suited for pathway development. Um, we play an integral role in hospital operations and our EHR experts. We understand systems of care and what needs to be done to meet quality improvement targets. We understand patient safety and we know how to work in teams. And we often have leadership roles in the hospital that are useful for directing pilots or alleviating any red tape that may occur. So now I'm gonna move on to what we did at the University of Colorado. Well, just to give a brief overview, I would like to say that this process was more of a slow burn and then a huge explosion of work for us. Um, we were lucky in the fact that we had already started a inpatient clinical pathway program back in 2018 in conjunction with our antibiotic stewardship program. But honestly, to develop a pathway prior to post-COVID, we would usually take about three to six months to take it from authorship to deployment. So this is our timeline. On February 27th, we had the first case of community spread in the United States. On March 6th, we had the first case of COVID-19 in Summit County in Colorado, which is about an hour and a half west of us here in Denver. At this point, our hospitalist group started to slowly ramp up disaster planning, but it wasn't until March 13th when on a completely random conversation with our third party vendor for, for pathways, they offered to us the John Hopkins emergency room COVID pathway with John Hopkins permission. We took this pathway and literally completely modified it to fit our inpatient workflow and then went live with it in our hospital medicine division on March 18th. On March 25th, our use, or rather, um, a few days later after we deployed it on March 18th, our parent company, our parent organization, UC Health, which is made up of 13 hospitals across Colorado, got wind of our pathway and decided to, for all intents and purposes, annex it. They modified it to make it generalizable to all system hospitals, and on March 25th, they deployed it. One day after the pathway was deployed across the system, Colorado issued the stay-at-home order for the pandemic. The turnaround for all of this was incredibly fast. From getting the Johns Hopkins pathway to deployment in our division, it was five days. And from when we deployed our division pathway to when the system deployed it, it was eight days. And because of the urgency of the situation, the adoption rates were incredibly high. This graph depicts the, op the pathway openings from all the system hospitals. And our hospital is the big red line at the top because we are the largest hospital in the system. So far, we've had over 1,000 views and over 750 unique users using the pathway across the system. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to describe the planning part of our PDSA cycle. Thanks, Ananta. Uh, my name is Sarah Scarpedo. I'm also a hospitalist at the University of Colorado, and I'm director of the clinical pathways within our division. I'm going to talk about the planning phase of our rapid PDSA cycle. As Ananta alluded to in the timeline a couple slides back, the initial planning phase for our COVID pathway was a sprint to keep up with demand for centralized guidance within our group and the hospital, as well as the rapidly changing guidelines and evidence to support our content. Building a pathway during a pandemic is like no other pathway we've built before. 
Typically, we create a pathway over the course of weeks to months with the input of a handful of stakeholders and a committee of hospitalists who oversee pathway development. In contrast, this pathway was initially created over the span of just five days with input from dozens of stakeholders. We also usually update pathways, pathways once a year or slightly more often if changes in practice arise. In this instance, the rapidly evolving landscape of institutional, state, and federal policies and practices, as well as evolving research on COVID, means that we update the pathway constantly, sometimes even multiple times a day. With all these moving parts and input from so many different stakeholders, the pathway has also become a tool with more complex clinical decision making than we have seen in our prior pathways. Despite these challenges, we have gratefully received swift and strong support for the project. We have suddenly seen a flood of concentrated resources within our hospital system targeted at devising a unified approach to managing COVID-19. Once department and hospital administration got wind that we were developing the pathway, they provided significant support in terms of access to resources and a limiting red tape to allow us to move forward at an unprecedented rate. The first step to building a pathway is identifying resources and consolidating information. In Austin Klan's book, Steal Like an Artist, he writes that all creative work builds on what came before, nothing is completely original. Hospitals all over the world are developing plans and practices to deal with COVID-19. It's important to learn from other successes and missteps in order to create a tool that will do the most good. In developing our pathway, we took guidance from documents shared by our colleagues at Johns Hopkins, Mass General, and the University of Washington. We incorporated their ideas and built on them to fit within our institution and our patient population. So don't start from scratch. Reach out to colleagues at other institutions and identify resources that you can use to help build the content of your pathway. Additionally, we designated individuals within our institution who are up to date on the literature to act as subject matter experts. We created a shared living document to summarize the literature and resources gleaned from other areas that we used as the content basis for our pathway. It's important to note both for those who are writing the pathway and for those who will be using it that the vast majority of the content is coming from the lowest quality evidence. Our pathway is based almost entirely on expert opinion and case series coming from other countries. So this is another reason why it is extremely important to have dedicated champions to stay up to date on the literature and to have a means to rapidly update the pathway as new and higher quality evidence emerges. In order to facilitate this rapid information exchange, our institution and our division have developed several communication platforms that have helped us to be able to stay up to date in creating and maintaining our pathway. We receive daily emails from our clinical leadership regarding COVID-19 updates. Our incident command center has daily morning huddles. We have developed online forums where providers can ask questions and share ideas. We have twice weekly group Zoom meetings to talk over any updates. Providers on our COVID teams have daily afternoon huddles. And we have a file repository with all of the guidelines and primary literature that our group has reviewed. This allows us to stay on top of everything and to keep the pathway content updated in real time. However, a pathway is so much more than just content development. We have a team of individuals who have helped make the pathway usable and made it fit within our institution. We have the content managers whom I referred to in a previous slide and whose job it is to stay up to date on the literature, guidelines, and policies. We also have the builders who take the content and put it into a usable form within the pathway. We have IT support who help integrate the pathway into the electronic health record and improve the functionality within our provider's existing workflow. And we have stakeholder managers who are well connected within the department and within the hospital to ensure that we are engaging all appropriate stakeholders. Something really unique and remarkable about this pathway is that it is the only one we have ever built where information that we are providing to institutional stakeholders based on our literature review and content collection is actually informing changes in institutional policy and not just the other way around. So in that sense, it's created a platform for bi-directional flow for information between our team and hospital policymakers. One aspect that we did not manage as well was early involvement of all stakeholders, especially those at the highest level with the lowest interest shown on the top left here. This turned out to be both a blessing and a curse for us. It was a blessing in that it allowed us to move forward with piloting the pathway more rapidly. However, it made things somewhat more difficult for us on the back end as we scrambled to incorporate feedback that came in later from several key stakeholders. A challenge to any pathway is identifying and maintaining scope. 
This has been especially difficult for this pathway given the broad interest and focus on COVID-19. John will discuss this further during the implementation section, but in creating the pathway initially, it is important to make the pathway specific to providers only, to outsource elements to other care team members, such as nurses and social workers, to help simplify the pathway, and to strongly consider piloting the pathway to a smaller group in the initial stages in order to facilitate rapid deployment. When it comes to writing the pathway itself, it's important to identify the critical decision points in order to create a strong backbone for your workflow. For us, the decision points were when and how to test and retest for COVID-19, what labs to draw on how often, when to escalate care and call the ICU, when to start antivirals or immunomodulators, and when it's safe to discharge. All of our pathways stem from this backbone and flowed to allow providers to work through the pathway while addressing all of these key decision points. Ananta will talk more extensively on this later on, but I wanted to stress the importance of thinking about outcomes and measures for success in the early stages of planning. Engage a data analyst if you have the resources. Think about how you're going to measure adoption metrics, which will be important for the initial rollout of the pathway, and think about how you will measure outcomes metrics, such as lengths of stay and readmissions. To conclude the planning segment, I'd like to touch on several pitfalls to avoid, many of which we encountered ourselves. First is don't start from scratch. Steal like an artist and build on others' creativity. The next is to include key stakeholders. This will save you from duplicating work within your institution and help to get things moving more quickly. In a time of rapid change and desperate need for a unified approach, perfect is the enemy of good. Do not spend your time making things perfect. Roll out the pathway as you have it and continue to improve it as you go along. Watch out for anchoring. Be sure to address other common causes of fever, cough, and shortness of breath within your pathway. Everything may seem like it's COVID and more and more it is, but it's also important to keep our differential broad when, when developing clinical decision-making aids. And lastly, don't be afraid to give up control. Our team put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into making this pathway. The hospital system liked it and ultimately adopted it, so we have lost a lot of control over it. However, this has brought us closer to our goal of doing the most good for the most people, and we're grateful to have been a part of such a large and successful team. Next, I'm gonna hand it over to Jonathan Powell, who will talk about implementation of our pathway. Thanks, Sarah. So I'm Jonathan Pell. I'm one of the hospitalists uh, in the group at University of Colorado Hospital, and I'm also a physician informaticist. So I get to talk quickly about the easy part of uh, implementing a pathway, um, especially in this particular situation. So, you know, pathways are a clinical decision support tool, and we always consider um, a few different things in the IT world when implementing clinical decision uh, support tools and changing provider practice. So this is our standard, you know, Cotter's model of change, uh, which is an eight-step process that most of you have probably learned about. But this wheel was really kind of spinning out of control uh, because of the, the pandemic, as you can imagine. We didn't have to worry about creating a sense of urgency. The guiding coalition we had already established in our group with our pathway team, um, and they developed quickly a vision of how they wanted this stuff to go. Volunteers were easy to find, uh, and we were able to remove barriers. As you heard Sarah talking about, the red tape essentially uh, disappeared, and we were able to accelerate pretty quickly and implement changes that stuck. So one other piece about implementing clinical decision support tools. So we were able to implement our pathway directly into our electronic health record. And so here is three things that we kept in mind, or we always keep in mind when implementing clinical decision support tools, which is we need to get the right information to the right person in the right format through the right channel at the right time in the workflow. And this can be really critical. It turns out that our Pathways vendor is a third party vendor um, that does actually integrate into our electronic health record, which is one of the most, you know, the more popular nationally used uh, electronic health records. But in this particular circumstance, stance, we had uh, the ability to do things that we'd not been able to do before when implementing a cl clinical decision support tool. So normally when we implement a clinical decision support tool, um, we try to figure out providers' workflows, figure out where in the user interface we want to stick it, design it as best we can, 
And then we usually have to figure out how are we gonna educate on this intervention? And what do we do? We send out a bunch of emails to folks. We create some tip sheets that providers go to or don't go to. And we usually have, you know, about a 18% open rate on our emails. And the usage of our tip sheets is relatively minimal. But in this particular circumstance, we didn't have to do this. The sense of urgency was out there and providers uh, were kind of anxiously waiting for something to help them uh, with this new endeavor of taking care of COVID patients. So what we did is, this is a screenshot or a section of a screenshot from our electronic health record. For proprietary reasons, we don't have the entire screen, but I just wanted to demonstrate that when you logged into an inpatient's chart, the first thing you saw in front of you was a huge tab that said COVID-19 pathways. So regardless of what kind of patient you were taking care of in the hospital, as we knew, a large proportion of patients hitting our emergency room and coming to our floors were COVID positive patients, uh, that you would have this tool ready and waiting uh, in front of you. Once you clicked on that pathway, this is what the pathway looked like. So it actually opened up right in the middle of your the electronic health record user interface. And as you can see on the pathway, there are guidelines on the left-hand side, and then all of these blue links within the pathway had different uh, functionality associated with them. So there were certain clinical guidelines that you could click out to. There were certain protocols that you could click out to and easily access. You also had the ability to write orders. For example, on the top right-hand side of the screen there, you see it says consult ID. That would open an order uh, to consult the infectious disease service. So it fit, came in the right time in the workflow to the right provider and allowed them to continue the, the work they were doing. This, so that first slide you just saw was the initial management and testing for patients with COVID. The next step here was the management on the floor. Uh, and then further down, this is all a scrollable screen in our electronic health record, takes you next to what happens when patients don't do well uh, and require uh, ventilation and need to go to a higher level of care. This is just the example of our admission COVID pathway. We also have a discharge COVID pathway, which was uh, just rolled out within our hospitalist group. So Anunta talked earlier about our admission management and ICU transfer order set has been adopted at the system level across all 13 hospitals of UC Health. This one is being initiated uh, within our, has been initiated within our hospitalist group and will be rolling out uh, to the system level. Um, as well as you can uh, imagine, there's a lot of um, appetite for getting this stuff moved out as quickly as possible. So, you know, pathways can be rolled out in multiple different ways. And in its simplest form, pathways can be rolled out in the form of, of paper pathways, right? Or checklist like Peter Pronovost up in uh, Michigan. Uh, but the, the benefits truly of rolling it out in the electronic health record uh, lend well to this type of situation where things are rapidly changing. So one is it has to be accessible to everybody and everybody working in the hospital is accessing the EHR. It has to be quickly modifiable. Um, as you've heard from Sarah, the data that was contained in content within the pathway is rapidly evolving. And we had to make a way that we could quickly make updates to the pathway uh, on the fly. And this was changing every day um, to every other day. Uh, you can imagine if you rolled out a bunch of paper pathways to the floors, those would easily need to be torn up and thrown away in a couple of days and a new one you know, shuffled out to everybody. Another nice piece of implementing it in the EHR is this ability to report on uh, both the processes that the pathway supports as well as maybe even outcomes, which Anunta will talk about. And you have one centralized source of truth. So everything can point to that pathway, whether it's providers ordering from it or administrators trying to figure out what to do um, in different workflows uh, that these patients uh, require. Uh, and then, the last point here is absolutely critical that integrating within the EHR in a seamless way has been a make or break um, kind of solution for our COVID, or our pathways in general, in particular um, for, for, COVID, for the COVID pathway. I'm gonna finish up 
just quickly with pitfalls again, you're recognizing a common theme, but there were one big thing that we did realize when rolling out these pathways is just like any other tool implementation, you should think uh, pretty in an organized way about the design of that tool and the flaws that may come from it. We didn't necessarily have the time to go through each of these you know, seven steps of of designing new tools. You know, Don Norman's book is kind of like a Bible for me when implementing new IT interventions and designing them. But number seven, I want to point your attention to uh, was one that we fell into, which is how easily can one tell what the state the system is in? So when rolling out our pathway, um, it turns out that providers were quick to jump to it, but once they utilized the pathway or maybe utilized it a couple times, they felt like they understood the content that was contained within the pathway and they got out of it what they needed. What they did not realize uh, is that pathway was changing every day or two. And if they continued to practice, they were being left behind on the changing practices uh, at our institution or at least best practices at our institution. So there was no way that that tab that you saw showed when was the last time you went to it or had something changed behind that tab uh, since the last time you've been there. So I would say, if you are implementing a pathway, think about these uh, tool designs and make sure uh, you don't fall into that trap. A few other pitfalls uh, that we ran into um, that happens all the time is, you know, bandwidth of, re of IT resources can be slim, especially in the time of a pandemic. A lot of our IT team was dedicated to building new, you know, orders for the test. Our lab system was trying to, to integrate these newly developed PCR lab tests for COVID quickly. Um, and also the analytics team, we were pulling analysts from our IT team onto our analytics team to build out new reports and dashboards to understand, you know, where these COVID patients were, where they were coming from, where we were going in terms of the pandemic and to evaluate our need for extra resources, um, et cetera. So bandwidth on your IT team can be pretty slim. So make sure you have very uh, succinct asks uh, when you're gonna require resources. We talked about integrating into the electronic health record. I think we did a pretty good job of that, but without those the design problems that I talked about earlier, uh, one last piece, so you saw the pathway that included both the initial evaluation of patients with COVID, their management on the floor, and then into the ICU. And Anunta actually touched on this as well. Pathways really become this common stage that everybody is watching. And so it gave us the opportunity to coordinate with those different teams, including the ED, who was doing that initial management of COVID patients, and the ICU, who was receiving those patients when they decompensated. Um, but it was tough for us because we were implementing both sides of the pathway for our hospitalist group. It was tough for them to know what part they had done, we had done. As you can imagine, you know, ordering initial inflammatory markers, et cetera. We could have done a better job of coordinating with the ED or the ICU. And pathways really have this benefit over things like order sets that we use in the hospital that they can they represent a continuum of, of time um, that you can integrate different orders in um, policies, et cetera, through that pathway. Because though you become the central stage where everybody's watching, uh, you end up having a bunch of people who want to join in the party. So staying in scope is key. A after rolling out the pathway, everybody and their brother wanted to have their thing included in the pathway, meaning, you know, in the ED, how do we figure out who needs to have an emergent palliative care evaluation? So if we get to a resource strap space for ventilators, uh, that we don't have a bunch of people that haven't addressed goals of care. Um, operational leaders want to make sure if they're implementing any new innovative new tools that they want to throw it onto your pathway. That risks the fact that that pathway becomes this big beast that no one can get anything out of. And so make sure you stay uh, within scope when building these uh, pathways and integrating into the electronic health record. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anunta, who's going to talk about studying uh, pathways. Thanks, John. So um, I'll be honest, uh, thinking about metrics and dashboards while you're frantically trying to deploy a COVID-19 pathway is pretty difficult. But you have to think prospectively so that you have a good understanding of what your pathways are doing so you can make change into it, uh, changes to it quickly. So here are some things that we had to consider as we were doing this. Firstly, how often are you planning on getting the data and who's going to look at it? 
because of how things were changing and they were changing very quickly, we were looking at numbers and reviewing feedback almost daily to help us make decisions about modifications to the pathway. This can be research inten resource intensive, so you really have to think about how the data is being delivered and how to use your current, current workflow to, uh, or current workforce to do this. Secondly, you need to know who owns the data. When our pathway was locally used in our division, we owned all the data and we were responsible for acting on it. And most importantly, we knew where it came from. Most hospitals have multiple sources of data, the EHR, Visient, billing data, et cetera. So knowing how features of the data, uh, where the data came from and what their features are is really important for comparison purposes. Tracking your pathway use is also important. Whether you use paper or electronic, your pathway is going to go to places that you didn't know it was gonna to go to. Like in our case, our pathway wound up at standalone ERs or in the surgery department. This might affect your outcomes and it might also change the context of your pathway quite a bit if you find out that your audience is different than who you thought it was. And you may have to fit their needs into your pathway in some way. Lastly, and this was a major issue for us, is making sure to engage all of your stakeholders so you don't duplicate work. It's hard during a pandemic when everyone is working simultaneously on the same thing, but as we have found out, other people are doing this work too. So for instance, infectious disease was already doing chart reviews for symptoms onset, and the ICU was already getting data on ICU to floor transfer times. So definitely try to do your homework before building an entirely new data set, or think about asking your hospital to try to build a center repository for data. This slide is a pretty broad overview, but with COVID pathways, we put our metrics into two big buckets. First are the adoption metrics, which are on the left-hand side, and next are the process and outcome metrics. Because we're still early on in our deployment, the outcome metrics that we're looking at, length of stay, uh, ICU transfers, um, I'm sorry, mortality and readmissions, they're still fairly immature and honestly proprietary, so I'm not gonna go over those in this presentation. One important concept to think about as you're looking at adoption metrics is what your goals are for your providers. Our system has taken the stance that we want to improve quality of care regardless of whether you use the pathway or not, and that the pathways are guidelines, not policy. So as long as the providers know the content and do the right thing, that's okay. But it puts less weight on the accuracy of adoption metrics to reflect the current state of care. Instead, you're going to have to use your process and outcome metrics to compare those who've used the pathway to those who haven't to decide whether your pathway is valid. From a measurement standpoint, this can be incredibly challenging to evaluate and can create a huge delay in making decisions. So we've decided to use adoption metrics as a proxy for what's happening on the care level. Other institutions may choose to strive for 100% adoption as a goal, but this may not reflect the reality of what's really happening. Regardless, understanding this distinction is extremely important as you evaluate your adoption metrics. And you can actually see this in our adoption graph, which I showed at the beginning of this presentation. This red line I'm gonna focus on. Um, in the beginning, we have this huge spike, which is when the providers are looking at the pathway as it's just been deployed. It's now in their face in the middle of the electronic medical, re medical record and it's something new to look at. But then you can see that it drops off. Um, as providers are becoming familiar with it, they think that they understand all the things are, that are contained within it, within it even though the, the pathway is changing on a regular basis. And this demonstrates the need that we should probably be doing a better job of advertising these changes somehow to our providers as they become live. This next slide highlights another adoption metric that we've used. Because we integrated the pathway into the EHR, we were interested in knowing if a provider, once they go into the pathway, actually uses it and does the orders within the pathway. The yellow line in the top is the number of orders that were placed, and the blue line on the bottom is the number of pathway openings. You can see that once a provider goes into the pathway, they're putting in a lot of orders, which demonstrates its utility and integration into the workflow, and that the pathway may actually be impacting outcomes. So moving on to process measures, early on in the presentation, Sarah went over our key critical decision points which comprise the spine of the pathway. These decision nodes form our process metrics that we want to evaluate. 
One thing to remember with process metrics is that they can be resource intense to obtain and may require chart review due to the limitations of our reporting mechanisms. So you'll have to be thoughtful in how you approach these. For instance, at the bottom, you'll see when it's safe to discharge. We were particularly interested in this because we live in Colorado. In Colorado, we live at 5,280 feet, so our discharge criteria are a little different from other areas of the US. In normal times, we actually typically discharge patients on oxygen all the time. But COVID patients, because of their late decompensation, they're more tricky. So we built our discharge criteria based on expert opinion and what evidence we could find in the literature, taking into account where we live. But it's still unclear whether these are the right criteria. So we made a decision to try to evaluate all readmissions to determine whether we need to modify our discharge criteria to fit our population. Luckily for us, we have several providers that due to a multiple, re multiple of reasons cannot see COVID-19 patients. So we're using this workforce to do chart reviews on uh, these patients using a standardized data collection tool. Again, we're early on in this analysis, but I wanted to demonstrate how using these decision nodes to develop metrics can really help with project planning and goal setting. So these are just some pitfalls that we wanted to highlight that we've run into as we've done our pathway evaluations. First, as you're getting all this feedback in, be aware of the invisible army concept. In the midst of all the chaos, it's easy to be persuaded by your colleagues or others that you need to change things on your pathways due to reasons that are may or may not be true due to subjective experience or, quote, some other hospital's doing it, some other person's doing it. Be sure that there's supporting evidence prior to making any changes to your pathway and think about how it may have an impact on your metric strategy. Next, make sure to be sensitive to your COVID providers on the front line. They may not have the time to give you feedback on why they're using or not using the pathway. So you may have to seek out that information by doing informal surveys while you or your teammates are on the wards or in small group huddles. Email reminders and surveys are easy to send out, but if you're like me and I'm completely drowning in emails, your providers probably are not gonna have the time to respond. This is where developing that rapid information exchange that Sarah referred to um, can be incredibly useful. Third and most important, make sure to measure things that you're going to act on and think about your scope. While looking at the time of ventilation might be important, if you're a hospitalist and not an intensivist and are not going to impact ventilation time, then don't measure it. What symptoms a COVID patient had on admission might be interesting to look at, but if it's not gonna affect your floor to ICU time, you probably don't need to get that information to impact care. So how are you going to use that information that you've just gathered to enact, enact real-time change? Well, this is where we are now, and honestly, every single day is a new PDSA cycle to, for us. And to do this rapid cycle change, we had to have a lot of these pieces that we've already described to you in place. We already had that wide open window of opportunity and we know about the urgent need. Um, we also had to make sure that our hospital leadership was on board and that we need to make sure that whatever we did, it would be integrated into the workflow somehow. The pathway, most importantly, had to be a single source of truth so that everyone knew to reference it. And in order to do this, we had to make sure that the feedback was being fed to us through that rapid information exchange and that providers didn't have to go through 15 channels of red tape to get to us. It was then our responsibility to weed through that, those invisible army content, comments and make sure that there was supporting evidence. And then finally, imp quickly implement changes. This can be resource intensive, so you must have a really great team. And this is a team where everyone is on the same page, there's mutual trust, and they can help you make those edits and step up to make sure it's optimized for their workflow. Without our team, we never would have been able to accomplish any of this. So we just wanted to recognize all the individuals that have participated in making these pathways and making our pathway program a success. Thank you so much for attending our webinar. Um, please let us know if you have any questions. We're happy to answer them now. Great. Thank you, Anunta, Sarah, and Jonathan um, for this really informative and thoughtful approach to developing clinical pathways. Um, responding to COVID-19 and how to how to do so in a um, in a structured way, but also in a way that is highly responsive and adaptive to the continual let's say fire hose of information that keeps it seems to keep coming about uh, COVID-19.
Um, so I do want to remind folks if there are questions, please type those into the to the question box, and uh, we can get to as many of them uh, as possible. Um, while we're waiting for that, um, I, I had a few questions from staff that we've seen uh, come up in discussion forums and things like that. And, and actually, it relates to the volume of information and the volume of input. Um, so Jonathan and or any of you, um, but Jonathan specifically mentioned, you know, when you have sort of multiple inputs and everyone um, everyone sees sort of an opportunity to put their concerns, their questions, their their pathways into a clinical pathway. How are you actually managing all of those inputs and trying to stay on scope? That seems like, especially during the pandemic, that would be particularly challenging um, when when everyone is is trying to kind of figure figure things out together, and everything seems like it's um, uh, you know pr number one priority. So I'm this is Jonathan. I'm gonna actually hand that to Anunta, um who who handled a little bit of that on the you know kind of content side on the IT side I just have to put in there what she tells me to so Anunta if you want to talk about <laughs> where, where you take these requests yeah so we are getting feedback from providers throughout the system on the pathway all the time um, we actually take it to a central steering committee within the system so after our pathway was annexed uh, the system developed a steering committee comprised of uh, content experts and IT folks and uh, chief medical officers across the system. And so we take this feedback back to the group and we honestly just throw it back and forth and we decide which ones make the most sense to put into the pathway. Is there evidence behind it? Does it make sense? Is it something that we can actually do at all the 13 hospitals? And um, we initially had, you know, as this pathway has, has lived on in the system, um, the amount of feedback has actually been somewhat manageable because I think we did a pretty good job of getting it right in the first place. Um, as new information comes in, we basically look at it and tweak it and then we try to figure it out where it best is best placed in the pathway because it's not just about what the content is, it's about who is actually going to execute that content um, and uh, where it makes sense in the algorithm. Um, so. Uh, I think it's it's really about having a, a really uh, deep team that has those levels of experience from building pathways to understanding the content to understanding different levels of care. And would you say, Anunta, you know, we kind of tried to stick to the, we talked about those five core decision points contained within the pathway and then said, hey, let's build around that effectively. Some of that meant beefing it up, some of it meant slimming down, but kind of sticking to those things. For example, the discharge pathway decided it needed to be its own separate pathway, right? Because if you keep just stacking, you know, the trailer onto the second double wide trailer to the porch, at some point you want to start with a brand new foundation uh, and build what you want on top of it. So we've tried to kind of keep things separated uh, so that you can just focus on um, what are your particular goals for an individual pathway and don't let that scope creep get out of control. That's great. I think that's, uh, I think that's good advice for, for all of us as we're, as we're building um, tools and resources um, around COVID-19 uh, to really think about the, the foundation and, and when you might need to kind of start, start back over with the new foundation. Um, another question is, uh, you know, some of some of our membership work in um, hospitals that maybe aren't connected to academic medical centers or large health systems that might have more resources or bandwidth to, to set this up. Do you have any sort of guidance or advice um, for those hospitalists about how they might be able to get connected in or implement similar things um, in, in their in their hospital? Um, I, you know, we actually, within our hospital system, you know, we do have much smaller hospitals that do struggle with this. Um, and I think the, you know, and then a lot of us have also worked at small community hospitals who weren't associated with academic medical centers. So we feel your pain. <laughs> um, I think that going back to a concept that Sarah discussed is, 
is beg, borrow, and steal, um, steal like a artist is really important. Um, I think that um, it's possible to implement a pathway as a paper pathway and to get that buy-in, particularly now when the window of opportunity is wide and there's so much urgency for all of us to get in the same page. I think the most important points here are look what's out there in the environment, try to get something that is your best fit, deploy it and just make sure that you're updating it as frequently as possible to keep it up to date uh, and so that people trust the things that are on there. You're going to have to think about version control, making sure that you clearly put on that document somewhere that this is the most recent document, use this and advertise it well. But I, I think that it's possible for any hospital to do this, whether or not they have an EHR or whether or not they're associated with a academic medical center, because there's just so much stuff out there now that is really applicable to all sorts of situations. John and, is, and Sarah, do you have anything yeah, else? On? I was just gonna say, and from an IT perspective, having one centralized source of truth doesn't mean you need to have a third party vendor that integrates into your electronic health record most facilities have a some sort of secure either you know sharepoint site or uh, database where this information can live where you can just link out to it with a web browser but as long as Anint has said that there's one source of truth that is updated regularly that everybody has access to uh, and it doesn't have to be anything fancy um, it can be like I said as, as simple as a link that lives on your you know home page for your hospital um, that links out to this pathway of care that can be updated regularly I think you can still pop, pull it off Obviously, it's not the perfect clinical decision support implementation, but I think given these times, people will take that extra step of pull information and going out there to get it if they find it useful, rather than that push and stick it in front of their eyes uh, in the middle of their workflow in the EHR. And one thing that I think might be easier at smaller hospitals is just the communication piece of it. Um, you have fewer people to talk to and to integrate. so. I think it's um, maybe even a little bit easier to keep those lines of communication open. Um, it still takes effort and planning, um, but that's a little bit of an advantage that you might have at a smaller hospital. And if you don't have that content team, right, that's constantly perusing the literature, vetting their things that they find with a group and getting it out there, remember there are lots of institutions that are publishing this stuff everywhere from you know, YouTube to their just, you know, homepage for their hospital, whether that be, you know, Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, Johns Hopkins, uh, people in Washington. So don't worry about putting together that team of content developers if you just keep your kind of sniffers out for when that information is being established for protocols at different institutions. That's a great point. And we do, um, just as a brief aside, SHM has um, links to several uh, sets of protocols on our uh, coronavirus um, resource page for hospitalists. Um, again, it's, it's certainly not exhaustive, um, but there's a lot of resources out there for folks to use. And I think it's a great point about keeping keeping eyes and sniffers peeled to, to, um, to see what's out there. Um, one, one additional question, uh, you know, in, in sort of normal times, you know, especially looking at measurement, um, you know, there's, I think, opportunities to to learn and grow and also celebrate the successes when um, when uh, groups are performing well on measures and and certainly communicating out performance on measures. Can you talk a little bit about the strategy for doing that in such a uh, sort of time crunched and resource intensive time? Like, how are you? How are you communicating successes? How are you um, communicating performance on, on the few metrics that um, are sort of readily available around your clinical pathway? Um, that's a really uh, interesting point because it is really hard because not only are all of the leaders who normally would be responsible for doing that completely being barraged, um, the data isn't always very clear. Um, we uh, have daily emails that are sent out about the numbers of COVID patients, who's going to ICUs, number of patients being ventilated, 
um, discharged. Um, and we honestly are using more of the celebration of the case of the, pa the patient who was very sick who managed to get discharged to kind of motivate our providers right now. Um, we do have the adoption data um, that we've just started getting. I mean, it's only been two weeks. But to be honest, I mean, I think that our providers, um, the adoption data for them isn't quite as useful um, because they're going to use the pathway in their workflow, wh whether or not we give them adoption data or not. <laughs> um, it's useful for us to know who else we need to reach out to, but to them, I don't think they're as interested in that. As far as the, the actual process and outcome measures and looking at mortalities, those, again, as I said in, during the, my section of the presentation, the data is so immature that we don't really, we really can't use it to make huge decisions. Um, our readmissions are actually not huge. Um, and so, um, and I think that is a celebration in a way of what we're doing, but I honestly also think because of how this disease is presenting and the delays in the decompensation, we really don't know what's going to happen to these patients at the end of all this. So um, I, I think that really just kind of the daily updates of the numbers and how we're doing and thinking about the overall public health data of we're flattening the curve is really more important to our providers right now. And Anita, would you say, you know, our operations group within our hospitals group uh, does a really good job. We have a centralized prep platform kind of message board where anybody can post their ideas. It's kind of like a, a wiki page of ideas of things that they're either seeing on the front lines or that the data folks are seeing as part of their data polls. And we had a lot more control over that stuff when it's just managed within our hospitalist uh, group. Um, but as it's extended to the system, we've lost a little bit of that control of, you know, making those minute changes to the pathway. So Anunta was talking about discharges. We could review those, you know, readmissions and see on our discharge pathway, did they meet the discharge criteria before they were discharged? And maybe if they would have met the criteria, we could have prevented that readmission. So the data is starting to, you know, feedback in small ways, but it's really hard to implement those changes like stiffening up the discharge criteria when all of a sudden this is now being implemented at a you know a 13 hospital level that's great and i think we'll all be learning so much more in the coming months as we hopefully have a, a chance to the country get the chance to take a breather and figure out figure out uh, what to do for next steps um, so that's all we have on questions. I don't know if uh, Anunta, Sarah, or Jonathan, I, any of you have any sort of closing thoughts you'd like to share? Um, I would say if this is something that you're finding in your institution, just, just do it. Don't let the fire hose of information sway you. Um, beg, borrow, and steal. And just implement something so that all of you guys can be on the same page. Um, I think these patients, as we're finding, um, go through a pretty fairly predictable course of disease. And so um, really helping your colleagues who haven't been on the inpatient floors is, is an important thing. Um, we're all a team. We're all in this together. Um, and so uh, helping each other um, is important, and this is one way to do that. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you all three of you so much for taking uh, the hour out of your day today to share to your uh, perspectives and expertise on this and um, to share uh, what the University of Colorado is doing in terms of building clinical pathways. This has been enormously uh, in informative and helpful. Um, as a reminder to everyone, um, SHM is going to continue to be building resources throughout the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and all of those resources, including this webinar and recording, are going to be posted on our resource page, which is hospitalmedicine.org slash coronavirus. Um, on behalf of everyone at SHM, we truly want to thank all of you for the work that you're doing uh, in your communities and for your patients. Um, it's, it's really uh, incredible to see the work that you're doing both on the front lines and then that many of you are doing in sharing uh, 
experiences and perspectives across the field of hospital medicine. It's truly inspirational, and um, all of SHM staff are thankful for the work that you do. So with that, thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon, and we look forward to uh, seeing you all on our next webinar. Thanks, Joshua. Thank you. Thank you.